everyone. Welcome to this decimation chapter by chapter breakdown series. And the first chapter we're going to go over is the chapter that covers soldier characters. We're going to walk you through all the details, tell you some of the concepts behind the scenes, the design, and give you a little bit more of a verbal overview. Uh, so as you're reading through the core rule book, you get a better sense of what some of these things are beyond what's even written there. Now, the whole theme of the entire decimation game is kind of stated on the first page. This game bridges the gap between two types of games. War games, whose players often have scholarly levels of knowledge of military history, weapons, and tactics, and role-playing games, where a vicarious and fantastical sense of adventure drives the player's every decision. So this game is not a war game. It's really more of a role-playing game, but it taps into the elements that make war games tactically fun. The fun comes from playing tactically. And so from here, we're going to talk about this first chapter which is the soldier character chapter. Now in a role playing game, you might consider this to the character creation section where they talk about your ability scores or your base attack bonus and things like that. When you first get started with any role playing game, you're going to create a character. Well, in decimation, we call them soldier characters and it has a number of key points here that we're going to go over. One of them is the core innate skills which in many ways completely replace what we call ability scores from D&D and things like that. We go right into skills. We don't have any core statistics that we then generate skills from. Um, we're going to tell you, we're going to show you how you generate those innate skills. And then we're going to talk about battle ranks, which is very similar to levels in some role playing games. And we're going to talk about how the innate skills increase per battle rank. So you become more skillful as you gain more experience playing the game which then increases your lethality very high. And then the encounter survive method of how do we gauge, how do you progress as a soldier in a game? And then very last thing we're gonna cover in that first chapter of the rule book is the battle rank innate modifier, which you probably recognize some other uh, role playing games in the OGL system where there's some kind of core modifier that increases as you uh, advance your character. So let's just jump right into this first chapter. So. Like I said before, we're calling your characters soldier characters. Now, you could just call your character a character if you want to. The thing that's a little different is unlike in most role-playing games where everyone's kind of encouraged to only play one character, you can play as many soldier characters as you wish. Um, since you're playing real men and women, you're not playing dwarves or, or dragonborn or dark elves that have all this lore and, and societal you know, means of playing uh, or, or preconceived ideas of what their culture is like you're playing real people so whether you're playing an italian soldier or someone in the british eighth army or the special air service or american young gi those are people right so you're playing soldier characters you're thinking of them as people you're thinking of them as actors in a film so when you have a film like <laughs> a bridge too far or where eagles dare sometimes the ensemble cast of heroic characters who are playing together is you and your friends. So whether one of you is playing two or three or four of those soldier characters, it really depends upon how good you are at managing tactical combat. So that's a key element that's very, very different. I always encourage people when they first start playing the game to just play one soldier character until you get really good at the combat. Because one thing that's very interesting is that everything is pre-compiled on your character sheet. The variables that happen when you're actually playing are very small. So you're running around knowing what you can do with your rifle at certain range as you knowing how how good you are at hitting something and you start making tactical decisions based on what your actions are in every uh, tactical turn so unlike a lot of D&D games and fantasy role-playing games which isn't anything bad it's just very different the emphasis is really really on what do you do what does your heroic character do right now not having to look up a bunch of numbers behind the scenes and try to remember what a skill check might be all right let's get on with that so there are six innate skills we don't have strength and agility, dexterity, charisma, education, social standing, all these types of things. The original role-playing game universe began with these ideas that they were not going to be tabletop Avalon Hill war games. They were going to be role-playing games where you, one person, role-play one character. And therefore, we want that character to be different from you so that character would have greater strength than you, maybe be smarter than you, maybe have more charisma than you. So we would roll all these ability scores, okay, a concept that's been around forever, so you could create a fictional character that's not you from thin air. 
Whereas in decimation, you're creating a person, you're creating a soldier character, a real human being based on what you want them to be. So if someone were to ask you, hey, if you were a soldier in Saving Private Ryan, which one of those soldiers do you really like? Do you like the sniper character? Do you like the Tom Hanks character? You know, do you like the Matt Damon character? So the idea is for you to create film-like characters that you have an affinity for. You already have media references for these types of characters. You could, if you wanted to, you could actually look up someone who was a real soldier in the war and pretend you're playing them. The degree in which you f you inject yourself into playing the character is up to you. You can play an anonymous GI with a name like Marcus McIntyre from St. Augustine, or you could create your grand great grandfather. So that's completely up to you. All right. So when we do this, we don't roll strength, intelligence, dexterity, all these kinds of things, because in the original D and D, Boot Hill, all those kinds of games, uh, you would take those core ability scores, and then they would determine what the next set of variables were, and then they would determine what the next set of skills are. And then when you're playing a game like Pathfinder or 5th edition D&D today, you're making all these acrobatic checks and all these kinds of things. All those things are coming back from your core ability scores. Since we don't have lock picking and things like that in this game, we use a more generic action check system. We don't need to have a chart of seven pages of skills. We don't need a Steve Jackson games, you know, GURPS system like that, which there's nothing wrong with that. We're just paring it down because the combat is very, very frenetic and very lethal very, very quickly. And that is the main core fun factor of the game is playing in the combat situation. So what are those six and eight skills? You have a shooting skill, you have a firefight tactics, a reaction time and then we have ones that are more innate with who you are as a person with your mind uh, your your knowledge things you've learned the intuition and awareness now intuition and awareness do sort of feel kind of like maybe an agility or wisdom but it's slightly different let's define them over here on this right hand side this is this section here we're going to read through these really really quickly there are subtle differences in these and it's on purpose the shooting skill is your expertise at aiming, handling, like re re you know, reloading, cleaning, stripping down, fixing jams, and shooting weapons. That will increase with experience. The more you're under fire in life or death situations, in combat, using your weapon, even if you don't shoot it, handling it, holding it, keeping it with you, reloading it, thinking about when to shoot it, thinking about when not to shoot it, that all gives you experience. You're not going to gain experience from picking up gold coins or just getting kills. Um, it's not like that at all. So your skill is going to increase. Your know, firefight tactics is subtle experience-based knowledge gained from fire combat in complex situations where multiple enemies come into play. Think of this as like as you play chess, right? You know what kind of things opponents like to do. This is what firefight tactics is like. Uh, shooting skill might be good, how good you are at moving the chess pieces. Are you really good at controlling the rook? Are you really good at controlling a bishop or a knight? Firefight tactics, how good are you at playing chess against another player? Now in firefight situations, you have multiple enemies. And from that also comes knowledge, which we'll talk about in a minute, where you're, you start to learn, hey, what do the German army like to do? What do grenadiers like to do? What do the British 8th Army like to do? What do the Italians like to do in North Africa, etc.? Last one we have here is the reaction time. Now, the reason why these first three are white is because they're very interconnected, and the ones that are beige are a little bit separated. They're more mental-oriented. The reaction time is really just how good you are as a human being reacting to situations, both mentally and physically, with muscle memory in situations of immediate threat. You can be someone who's clumsy and can't hit a golf ball and can't shoot a free throw, but have incredible reaction time in combat because of your training and how well you've been surviving these situations. Your instincts in life and death situations get better. So it isn't really a situation where you've been predetermined with DNA of how your reaction time or your dexterity is going to be, and it is capped and it never increases. All of these uh, innate skills increase as you gain experience in the game. They get better and better and better. Now, the last three is knowledge, intuition, and awareness. Knowledge is your depth of military familiarity from exposure to conflict, battles, scenarios, equipment, situations with enemy forces. This increases with experience. As you'll notice, every single one of these increases with experience. It, intuition becomes kind of an instinctual thing. You, you have tactical thinking, the ability to predict, anticipate, exploit the enemy human behavior. Like you might have a sense of like how does an MG42 German squad operate? When do they like to reload? When do they like to set up the gun? When they do that, where is the reloader like to sit? What side of the, of the gun is he loading from? How many rounds are they going to fire before they get too hot? How many rounds are they going to fire before they start to reload? And when they do reload, what is the other guys in the squad doing? That becomes from the 
intuition and the knowledge paired together. The knowledge I would say would be here's the general knowledge. You know, Panzer IVs like to do A. When they're attaching a village, they like to do, you know, this type of movement with infantry soldiers behind it. You know these things on paper. Your intuition tells you when they're going to act differently to something. Like, hey, if we throw a grenade at the front of the tank, what do the guys in the back of the tank do who are on foot? What's their normal kind of reaction? Well, you've experienced situations where you can start to predict that type of human behavior. Last sense is awareness. How in tune are you with the sounds of battle in your in your operational theater? Uh, when you hear a rifle shot, can you tell is that a you know a bolt action rifle, a semi auto rifle, a, a, you know, whatever it is? Can you hear footsteps and tell that's German soldiers? Can you hear engines going by and tell it's a diesel truck? The awareness really comes from a blending of knowledge and exposure and also your ability to understand where it is, what it is, and what does it mean to you. So these things are very slightly lofty. Um, they're, they're a combination between statistical numbers and numbers that will increase over time. So we can use some kind of a dice mechanic to determine your success and failure in certain situations. So we don't use a d20. We use d100. Games like Top Secret and Boot Hill use a D100, and there's probably a few other games that maybe I haven't played over the last 45, 50 years that use a D100. I decided in the game when I was designing it to make it D100 because the concept is basically, what are your chances to do this? What are your chances to make a free throw? What are your chances to win the lottery? What are your chances to you know, hit that target at 50 feet away with a revolver versus a Walther PPK, right? So everything in the game uses a D100. When you start to create your first soldier character, it's pretty straightforward. What you do is you roll a D100 and you ignore any number lower than 10 after you've divided it in half. So let's say we rolled an 80. You've rolled an 80, 80, 80, right? That's actually a 40. So when you first start your character out, you take that D100 roll and divide it by 2. So if you rolled a 13, it wouldn't be you know 6.5. You would just round it back up to 10. So by the time you get done creating your character, you have shooting skill, firefight tactics, reaction time, knowledge, intuition, awareness. There are all values between 10 and 50. Now, you say to yourself, how come they're not 70? How come you're allowed to go over 50? These things are going to increase as you gain experience. And let's talk about that next. Let's go to this next page here. You have a thing in a game called Battle Ranks, and they're very similar to what you might call as levels. There's only 10 of them. They're broken out into two categories. Um, there are, um, let's go to the next. There's veteran ranks, right, and seasoned ranks. So seasoned ranks is like, I'm a complete noob. I just arrived at the battlefield. I've only been in one or two firefights. I'll be one or two encounters, one or two missions. From battle rank one to five is seasoned uh, battle rank. From uh, rank six to 10 is veteran ranks. What happens is every time you survive an encounter, and it doesn't have to mean you fired your weapon, Okay, a situation where you're in a tactical turn, you know, fight where you had to make a decision what to do, and you lived through it and did not die, right? You are going to gain a tick mark called an encounter survive number, as you see on this chart right here on page 18. Right. This is version 6.1 I'm going through. So if you're, if, if, if I've released version 7.5 at a later date, the numbers may be different for the pages, but these numbers will probably stay the same. So as you can see, these things are going to rank up relatively quickly, and then they get much more difficult to rank up. So getting from battle rank 6 to battle rank 8 is a tremendous difference of 120 encounters survived. Now, this doesn't mean you've played, you know, seven missions or eight missions over the course of six months with your friends you could be playing a mission and have 12 encounter survived situations happen in one simple mission um, the reason why that is is that you gain experience on the spot there's no going off and training somewhere there's no go back and re-roll all your stats again you might have to do a little bit of mathematical changes because what happens is every single innate skill increases with each battle rank if you check this table right here so let's say you start playing and you got a character, a soldier character that's fresh out of training, and you're deployed to North Africa, and you're the British Eighth Army fighting the Italians near the line, near you know Algeria, Libya, all that kind of stuff. So, and you went through you know one combat scenario where you guys are clearing a minefield, some people, some, some Italian soldiers pull up, and start shooting at you. You survive that one encounter, and then you're playing a little further, and then you encountered a couple soldiers that were on patrol. Maybe you ev evaded them right and they didn't see you and then at nighttime fell you guys you know laid low for the night and then you moved into an italian camp and blew up a fuel dump and then you escaped and maybe you killed some soldiers on the way out that chased you that might be four encounters survived over the course of that little adventure it might take you two hours or an hour and a half to play it you know that would put you almost at battle rank three 
you know, because once you have five uh, encounters survived, you're at battle rank three. That means every time you gained one of those encounters survive battle rank increases, you get plus five to every single innate skill. So when it happened the first time, you got plus five to, guess what, all these right here, shooting skill, firefight tactics, reaction time, knowledge, intuition. So let's say that you were lucky and all these were 50 when you started. When you go to uh, this table here and you have plus five, now they're gonna be 55. And then when you get to battle rank two, now they're going to be 60. And you get to battle rank three, now they're 65. Now, the thing is, you're gonna have to go back and recalculate a few things based upon your firefight combat, which we'll do in another video. But these increases, they slow down pretty quickly once you get to like three or four. You get to this point, like I played a whole day with my friends. I'm at battle ranks, you know, four. I'm looking forward to getting to battle rank five when I get to 20 encounters. Survive so might take me two game sessions to get there. So in the beginning, you advance relatively quickly, which prevents you if you have a very low set of numbers from feeling uh, really, really weak. Unlike a lot of other role-playing games, you actually don't feel very, very weak if you just had all tens, right? You aren't completely pathetic because the op a chance for you to hit things, which we'll discuss in the video, has a base chance and is in and modified by your battle rank modifier, but your weapon and how you use it, your training, is has a tremendous benefit on how far out you can shoot, how accurate you can be. All right, so as you can see, we start off with 10 to 50 in the six and eight skills, as you survive encounters, right, which can be a slightly subjective for your game master, but it's pretty obvious, like you you survived the encounter, you didn't necessarily get killed or shot. You could have gotten shot, but you didn't get killed. Um, every time you gain a battle rank, you gain an innate skill increase. So let's go on to the next page here. So this encounter survive thing I've talked about a few moments, there is an actual example on page 20 of a situation where some guys are paratrooping in, they hear some German motorcycle crews coming down the road, they decide to hide their chutes and lay down low in the grass. The Germans walk around the field, they don't find them. Um, they can't tell where they are, they get back on their motorcycles, go back to camp and say they didn't see anything. That's an encounter survive type of situation. Now, the last concept we have in this chapter before we move on to the next video, which is gonna cover uh, the game mechanics like measuring time, which will be in another video. We wanna talk about this battle rank innate modifier on page 20, that's one down here. So you heard me mention it a moment ago. So as you can imagine, as you gain battle ranks, Remember, they have nothing to do with what rank you are, whether you're a private or lieutenant, second lieutenant, that doesn't matter, that's completely different, that's just fluff around the edges, that's command related things, which won't really affect you too much of the game. Um, the battle rank innate modifier gives you tremendous bonuses to your firearm combat. So as you gain these ranks from experience, you're getting better, you're becoming more accurate, and you're becoming more lethal. This modifier affects a lot of things in the game, you may find it very similar to things that you've seen in other role-playing games like base attack bonus or ability modifiers like in Pathfinder, um, but they're not they're treated a little differently. There's no other uh, fortitude reflex saving throw type you know, mechanics that come off of that, but there are situations where you're making uh, action checks later on that we'll describe. They're trying to do a heroic action that isn't really combat related like jump off a train and not break your leg as you roll things like that are trying to shoot something out of the sky that's almost impossible to do it the difficulty of the actions later on are heavily modified by the battle rank and a modifier they also have a direct impact on your hit location you may hit more lethal areas of the human body because your battle rank and a modifier which means you're very very experienced at shooting at human targets means you can try to shoot to kill better than just shooting at the person who's out there running around, the other soldier, and hoping to hit something. As you get much more experience, you become much more in tune. I hate to make a reference to James Bond, okay, which is fantastical, top secret type stuff, but if you see the last James Bond movie, you see how absolutely, extremely lethal and accurate that the main character is with the pistol, right? And even when he's using uh, an assault rifle, you know, he turned the corner, boom, boom, he's nailing people. And other people are shooting him and they're always missing. That would be an example of, you know, someone at battle rank one, two, and three against someone who's at battle rank 10, to be quite honest with you. So it has a big impact on the game. All right, let's slow down here and take a step back and talk about the high concepts here. The high concepts of all of Decimation is that I'm playing a character. The smarter I play, knowing what I can and can't do with firing dis and discharging firearms and trying to hit targets, how well I survive in combat, I increase my ability to do that even better. And I hate to keep using my basketball analogy all the time, but the more free throws you shoot, the more repetitions you get, the more you're going to get really, really Steph Curry type accurate with your three-pointers. So that is something that any player 
can understand. Play more, get better. It doesn't require you to do any trickery. Just play as if you're a soldier really there, even if you're not a military person. Do the kinds of things you think you've seen in films or movies that feel cool to you, right? Trying to shoot enemies, trying to stay down behind cover. There's rules for all these kind of things to control it without a lot of uh, mathematical trap challenges along the way. So the more experience you get, which means you don't have to just get kills, okay? It isn't like a deathmatch game, like Battlefield or something. Um, the more you play smart and live through the war and live through the battles and the scenarios you play through, the more powerful and more lethal your soldier character gets. But you can still be killed if you're very, very re uh, reckless. So that's the high concept of how we generate our soldier character in Decimation. If you have any questions or comments, just pop them down below. I'll be happy to... Uh, to field those questions for you guys. We'll talk to you real soon. We're going to go to the, the next video. We'll cover our next chapter and we'll talk about more detail about some of the core game mechanics. Okay, great. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.